Last week we were looking at chapter 4 of Philippians. Uh, most of the men, a lot of the men missed it because they were on that retreat. I only got through the first four of seven commands that Paul is giving to the church. And so we're going to review those four and then finish the final three today. So this is part two of Rejoice in the Lord Always, part two. Pastor Nathan put on the screen there that we're going to start on September 12th, a new series in Jeremiah. That's a Lord willing, because if next week I realize I can't finish the rest of this chapter in one week, we'll have to have a part two again, and then we'll push off Jeremiah one more week. So if you want to stay in the New Testament for one week longer, pray that I have to have a part two. We're in a series uh, called Joy on the Journey. As we go through life, our lives should be characterized by joy. The whole book or letter that Paul writes to the uh, people, church at Philippi, is about be joyful. Be joyful. And so we're looking at this letter that Paul wrote to the church. And we're looking at chapter 4, last chapter. So turn there in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 and follow along as I read. Therefore, in light of everything I've just said in chapter 3, therefore, my beloved brethren whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Eudia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you to also help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you thanking you for your word. Even as Paul is coming to the conclusion of this letter that he wrote to a church so many years ago. It still has very much applicability to us today. And so, Lord, may the Holy Spirit of God work through me in such a way that we understand the truth of your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Paul's making seven final appeals. They're commands, actually. They're mostly in the imperative tense, which is a command. And he's making these appeals to the family of God. And so let's review the first four we covered last week. First one is stand firm in the Lord, verse 1. At the very end, he says, stand firm in the Lord. Notice how he, he uses these affectionate terms for the church. He calls them my beloved brothers or my beloved brethren. He calls them my beloved at the end, twice in one verse. He says, I long to see you. Right now he's in prison in Rome awaiting trial. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die, but he's awaiting trial. But he says, I long to be there with you. You're my joy, my crown. So no matter what the culture throws at you, stand firm. In the Lord. The appeal is to stand firm. It's a military term, meaning hold your ground. Don't retreat. Stand. Now we stand in the Lord. Because you're the Lord's, because all that the Lord has done, because you're in Christ, stand firm. Remember at the end of chapter 3, he says that you're citizens of heaven, and because you're citizens of heaven, stand firm. You really belong to a different realm. Don't let your guard down. Hold your ground. 
No matter what the culture is doing around you, hold your ground. Stand firm. Paul starts off in the first chapter, for me to live is Christ. Your life should have be Christ living through you. Stand firm. That's the first appeal. Second appeal is live in harmony in the Lord, verses 2 and 3. Because you are the Lord's, because you're in Christ, because of all that Christ has done for you, you are to live in harmony. The words really in the Greek say, be of the same mind. You need to be in unity, church, in unity, same mind. And now we have two women who are called out by name forever. They're known in Scripture as having disagreement. I'm sure when they got to glory, they're saying, Lord, can't we just do away with that verse too? Paul says, I urge you, two women, I urge you. I plead with you, I beg you. Live in harmony in the Lord. Be in agreement in the Lord. Because you're in the Lord. Because you belong to Christ. At the end of verse 3, it says, you, you women, you've, you shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. You were partnering with me in the, getting the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ out. The English Standard Version says, you labored side by side in the gospel with Paul. And there were others that ministered with Paul. Clement is one, and other fellow workers, unnamed. And all of them were believers their names are written in the book of life. Here we have these two women. Their names are written in the book of life. And yet in the church, there's a disagreement. They're not in harmony. And Paul urges them. He pleads with them. He's telling these disagreeing women, live in harmony because you're the Lord's. They need to have the same mind. We talked last week about how one of Satan's major strategies is to cause division in the church. One of the things of the flesh, our fleshly nature, is factions, causing factions. So live in harmony in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord, live in harmony in the Lord. Third was rejoice in the Lord. That's an imperative, it's a command. Rejoice in the Lord, and the text says always. He even repeats it. Again, I will say rejoice. Even when there's hardship, rejoice. Even when there's suffering, rejoice. Even when there's persecution, rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, the shortest verse in the Bible, rejoice always. And outward rejoicing begins with a joyful heart, a changed heart. You belong to Christ. Rejoice. Of all people in the world, Christians should be the most joyful. And how does the world see Christians? As people filled with joy? No. No. We, who's, how do we change that? Well, try smiling more, people. Oh, we can't see the smile if you're wearing a mask. Pull it down a little bit, Anna. Let me see you're smiling. Rejoice. If your heart is joyful, it should start to show on your face. Amen. Rejoice is in happiness. Joy is in happiness. But joy should often show itself in happiness. Well, we spent a lot of time last week on that, so let's move on. Unfortunately, Paul had to say in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without grumbling, without complaining, and disputing, fighting. Why would he have to say that to a church? How could that happen in a church? We always get along. We always in agreement. No. We should be people of joy, even when we disagree. Fourth appeal. Make your gentleness known to all people. Verse 5. Make your gentleness known to all people. That adjective called gentle, it only appears five times in the New Testament. The Greek word, I'm not going to bore you with this, but the Greek word is really a compound word that has, you put two things together, like you need to be practicing restraint. 
one of the lexicons I looked at uh, by Frederick Danker, he says this word gentle, it's really got a wider range of meaning. The wider range of meaning incorporates the words of not only gentle, but kindness, courtesy, cur being courteous, yielding, not having to have your own way all the time, being tolerant. All of those ideas are in the word gentle. And our gentleness is to be visible to others. That's why he says, let it be known. Let, let people know this. Let, let it be shown to all people. Is this an easy command to, uh, to do, people? Let your gentleness be known to all. What about when the governor tells you to do something that you totally disagree with? Does your gentleness rise to the surface? What about a person who gets under your skin? Maybe there's a relational issue. Could be a marriage issue. Is gentleness shown from one spouse to the other, from a friend to a friend, from somebody who you're in, maybe not agreeing with? Gentleness. Let it be known to all men, believers to unbelievers. Even though people get under your skin and are your natural inclination is to fight, Paul says, let your gentleness be visible. And he gives a reason at the end of verse 5. The Lord is near. Not only is he close at hand, he's right with you. He's actually in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But he's also near in his near return. So, church, last week we stopped at that moment and said, okay, examine yourself. How many have four out of four nailed down? <laughs> I'm standing strong. I, I'm always in harmony with people. I'm always rejoicing, and I show gentleness all the time. Anybody four for four? I am. Yeah. <laughs> Dexter, four for four. Well, it doesn't get any easier. Number five. The command is actually at the end of verse six, which says, make your requests known to God. Now, it starts off with a command, a negative command, actually. Be anxious for nothing. Do not be anxious in anything, is what one translation says. Interestingly, the ESV, the English Standard Version, starts the sentence with the end of verse 5, which says, the Lord is near, do not be anxious in anything. In other words, he's, they're connecting the two. Because the Lord is near, don't be anxious. I think the Lord is near can either go with number 4 or with number 5. Because the Lord is near, there's really no need to be anxious. But let's be real, worry or anxiety affects every one of us to some degree. How many um, got that under control? I never worry. Anybody? <laughs> ne I never get anxious. No, I think we all have a little bit of anxiety in certain issues on certain things. There's daily stress of life. Children are back in school. Any anxiety? Test anxiety? What about money issues? That cause anxiety? Now that there's inflation, praise the Lord, those gas prices are going up. They need the money. Those oil companies need the money. <laughs> what about the future? Is the future more uncertain than ever now? That cause anxiety, worry? War. What about war? Anxiety producing? Sickness, the return of COVID, anxiety, worry. And to make matters worse, anxiety often leads to what's called depression. It says, do not be anxious for anything, for nothing. Is he the only one that came up with this idea of don't be anxious? No, how about our Lord Jesus? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. In 
verse 24 of chapter 6, the Lord Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. And then in verse 25, for this reason, I say to you, linking the two. He says, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he says, look at the birds of the air. Verse 27, and who by worrying can I even add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? And he gives an illustration about the lilies of the field. And he says in verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow was thrown into the furnace, meaning gets burned up with the heat, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Why did the Lord Jesus link faith with worry? He says, do not worry then saying what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear for clothing. For the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jews, the non-followers of Yahweh, eagerly seek all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom. Get your priorities in order. Seek God's kingdom, his righteousness. And then all these things that you're worrying about, they're going to be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Ain't that the truth? Every day's got trouble. It's a faith issue. How many remember Bob Newhart? Anybody? It's an old show. Anyway, there was one clip I just watched yesterday and it made me laugh because a lady comes into his office for counseling. She says, I, I have this fear. Every day I've got this fear that I'm going to be put in a box and buried in the ground while living. And so Bob Newhart says, as a psychologist, uh, well, has somebody threatened you by saying, I'm going to put you in a box and bury you? No. But I have this reoccurring fear every night. It paralyzes me. It puts me in a panic. And so Bob Newhart says, well, I, I've got a remedy for you. She goes, Oh, thank you, doctor. Two words. Well, should I, should I write them down? She gets out a pad of paper. Should I write them down? He says, no, most, most people can remember these two words. Okay, what are the two words? He looks at her and says, stop it. <laughs> That's scary to think you're going to be in a box buried alive. So stop it. What do you mean, stop it? He says, well, they're not hard words to understand. There are two. One, stop. Second word is it. Stop it. So she's shaking and she says, okay, but that's not my only fear. What else do you have? Well, I, I'm bulimic. I, you know, I throw up. And I, it, all because my mother told me I was fat when I was, we don't go there. He says, stop it. Stop doing it is what he's saying. Stop it. She goes, well, I also get into these relationships with these men, and these men are destructive to me. Stop it. What's his advice for everything? Stop, Stop it. She goes, but I also go to the bathroom, and I wash my hands all the time. And he says, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I do that too. Go to Bob Newhart and put in Stop It, and you're going to watch a six-minute video that will make you laugh. Now, what Paul's saying here is not stop it. We all have anxiety. We all have issues of worry. Paul gives a different antidote to worry and to anxiousness, and that is prayer. Prayer. The positive command comes at the end of verse 6, let your requests be made known to God. He began verse 6, but says, but in everything. That stands in direct contrast with the words, for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Everything means the big issues in your life and the little issues in your life. Everything, but in everything. 
He says pray. Notice the synonyms he uses for prayer. The first one is prayer. He says, but in everything by prayer. These are times of a supplicant, a person coming before God, recognizing that he is almighty, that we are not almighty, and that we come humbly before him. We are the ones who are dependent on him, and so we come to him as our master, and we recognize that he's God, we're not God. And prayer means the fact that we come in devotion. We're devoted to him. We come to him in worship. I don't mean singing. I mean we come to him bowed before him that he is God. That's prayer. Prayer is not now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It's not that. It's not dear Lord bless this food I'm about to partake of in Jesus name. Amen. It's not that. That's not prayer. Those are prayers. Teach them to your kids. But that's not what he's talking about when he says prayer. Prayer is coming before almighty God as a created being looking to the creator for help. I agree that. That's the first word, prayer. Second word is supplicate or supplication or petition. The Greek word says you recognize you have this lack in your life. You have this need in your life and you come before God and you pour out your heart to him. That's what it means to petition. You have an issue in your life. It might be a worry issue. It might be an anxiety issue. I don't know what the issue is, but you come before God and you say, with my whole heart, I have nowhere else to turn. I'm turning to you. Amen. That's what it means in petition. The third word here for prayer is requests. The things you're asking for, you're asking God to intervene in your life in some manner. You recognize he's God. And there's no issue, no problem bigger than him. And so you make your requests. And in the midst of those three words for prayer, he adds a qualifier. The qualifier is you come with thanksgiving. You come as grateful people. You come for people that are thankful for all that God is and all that he has done and all that he can do. What's the antidote to worry, to anxiety? It is praying in that way. And look at the benefits of prayer. It's getting the peace of God. Why do we pray in everything? Because we believe that God is greater than the greatest problem. Now, Paul doesn't say, let your request be made known to God, and he will answer your request. Let your request be made known to God, and he'll give you what you prayed for. That's not what it says. It says, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God. Peace of God. What's the peace of God? Well... Is it peace with God? Well, it can be that, but that only applies to a believer in Jesus Christ. It tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified or declared righteous by our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. At one time, before we came to know Jesus Christ, you were alienated. You were an enemy of God. But because of your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, when you put your faith and trust in him, you are now brought into a peace relationship. You're reconciled with God. And so, yes, the peace of God means you have peace with God, but I don't think that's what it's talking about here. This is the only place in all of Scripture where it uses the phrase peace of God. Now, it can mean the peace which God gives. They call that subjective genitive. Genitive meaning, how do you translate the word of? Well, it's a peace which God gives. It could mean that, but I think it means mostly this. It's the peace which God himself has, meaning descriptive genitive. God is peace. And God will give you himself, which is peace, when you pray. Wow.
And this God of, who's going to grant you his peace, this is the peace which surpasses all comprehension, all human understanding. God's going to give you his peace, and his peace will guard, it says, your hearts and your minds. It will guard, and that's another military term, which means it's a sentry who keeps watch over your hearts and mind. That's the guard. So when fear comes into my brain, into my life, there's God's own peace that says, not on my watch. When worry and anxiety comes into my life and God's peace is there and it's guarding my, my heart and my mind and says, not on my watch. But this only applies to those who are in Christ Jesus. This promise is only given to believers. That's why we have in Christ Jesus at the end. Do you realize that all of these promises stand firm in the Lord, live in harmony in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord? It's, a, well, as a believer in Christ, these are ours. And the peace that God has that guards your heart and mind because of whatever is on your issue in your life it applies to believers. It doesn't apply to all people who just pray to God. And then we get the word finally in verse 8. But you notice he said the word finally in chapter 3, verse 1. <laughs> so in chapter 3, verse 1, finally, I'm coming to the end. Oh, no, I got a whole lot more to write. So we get to verse 8, finally. But if you look after verse 9, there's still a whole lot more he's going to write. So what does he mean by finally? Well, he's going to give his final two commands. Before I look at number 6, Warren Wiersbe showed me a biblical illustration about having the peace, God's peace in a very difficult situation. It's in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel's elevated to a supreme position under Darius's rule, and the other Medes and the Persians were jealous of him and wanted to bring him down. So they went to the king and said, King, I want you to make this uh, law that if anybody prays to any god besides you for 30 days, well, let him be killed. Let him be thrown into the lion's den. And the king puffed up, agrees. And it says this in Daniel 6, verse 9. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, facing <laughs> Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Then these main men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Aren't those the same kind of words that Paul used in chapter 4? Supplication, petition, and prayer with thanksgiving. And so they take him before the king and says that he's violated your word. He's broken your law. And so they take Daniel and they throw him into the lion's den. Now, was the king happy about that? No. Was the king worried about that? He was dreadfully worried because nobody survives the lions. He couldn't sleep that night. And he couldn't wait to get up in the morning and go to the den to see if God was able to protect Daniel. And it says this in verse 23. Then the king was very pleased. He heard Daniel's voice. He was very pleased, and he gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. It's always a faith issue. It's a faith issue. Was Daniel worried, filled with anxiety as he was thrown into the lion's den? No, it's a faith issue. He had the peace of God in there. Were these just not hungry lions? 
No, because the king threw all the men who accused him in, and they were torn apart immediately. Now, finally, he gives two more commands, one in verse 8 and one in verse 9. The one in verse 8 is, dwell on these things. It's at the very end of the verse, dwell on these things. The word really is think, think. Dwell on those things worthy of praise. He says, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, this if is a special kind of if. It means assuming it's true. We assume it to be true. If there is, ex- if there is any excellence, there is. And if there is anything worthy of praise, there is. He says, then think or reckon or reason or consider. Dwell on these things. And then he gives a list of virtues upon which our minds should dwell. First is whatever is true. True, meaning truthful in every aspect of life. Truthful in your thoughts, in your words, in your actions. Whatever is honorable. This is the word for noble, something worthy of respect. Honorable. Whatever is right. This carries the idea of justice, of righteous, being righteous and just before our fellow man. Pure, no defilement, not tainted by evil, being chaste, innocent. Fifth, lovely. This is the only time this word is used in all of Scripture. It's, not, it's a different word from the n- normal words for love. This is the word lovely, meaning attractive, pleasing, beautiful, winsome. And then the last one, of good repute, is one Greek word, and it also is the only time it's in all of Scripture, one time right here. It means commendable, admirable. All six of these things could apply to the things of the Word of God, correct? You've heard the expression, garbage in, garbage out. What you put into your brain is going to come out through your mouth somehow. He says, you need to dwell on these six things that are all worthy of praise and excellence. What you might not know is that this virtue list is borrowed from Greek ethics. It's from the writings of Greek philosophers. Gerald Hawthorne in the Word Biblical Commentary wrote, these are the excellent qualities that belong to the culture of Paul's day, They're not at all unique to Christianity, which the apostle availed himself of and commended to his friends at Philippi. Paul put these same words that were part of what the philosophers were teaching, that these are virtues, and now they're part of Scripture. James Montgomery Boyce, former pastor of 10th Press in Philadelphia, he wrote... Christians can love all that is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable, wherever they find it. They can rejoice in the best of arts, the best of good literature. They can thrill to great music. They can thrive on beautiful architecture. Christians can thank God for giving us the ability, even in our fallen state, to create such things of beauty. See, I was always taught growing up that when you look at uh, Philippians 4.8, it always refers to only Christian things. We Christians are to live by grace, not by law, right? I grew up thinking that on one hand, there are sacred things, things that please God, and on the other hand, there are secular things. Sacred, good. Secular, bad. Listening to Bill Gaither, good. Listening to Simon and Garfunkel, bad. (laughs) Neil Diamond, bad. Okay? George Beverly Shea, good.
Dr. Gordon Fee, he also wrote a commentary, and he says, you know, God's given you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to discern what feeds your soul and what tears down your soul. We don't live by a list of don't do these things because they're not honorable, they're not true, they're not good. No, you don't live by a list. You have the ability by the Holy Spirit to discern what will build you up and what will tear you down. I was going to come in here and say, throw away your TVs, cancel your Netflix. (laughs) Right? That would be lists of bad. But Paul's saying, no matter what is in culture, if it's worthy of praise, if it's excellent, let your mind dwell on that. Think on that. And then he gets to the seventh one. Verse 9. And the command also is at the end of the verse. which is practice these things. So put into practice what you know is right biblically. Look at the verbs Paul uses in that verse. The things you have learned, received, heard, and seen. Paul taught God's truth, but he not only taught it, he modeled it. You've heard it. You've seen it in me. Practice those things. He said this before in Philippians 3.17. Brethren, join in my following my example. In other words, I'm modeling it. Follow my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 and 2, be imitators of me. Model me, he's saying, just as I also am of Christ. I model Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and you hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. He not only modeled it, he taught it. And they learned and they received. And we as a church need to put into practice the biblical truth we have learned and received. And we need to be like Timothy who Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. You, Timothy, however, continue in the things you have, what? Learned. And become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them. Who taught him? That from childhood you have known the sacred writings, meaning the scriptures, the Old Testament, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Messiah Jesus, Christ Jesus. So I ask you, are you putting into practice the biblical truth you've learned? Or are you kind of like picks and chooses what parts of Scripture you like and what parts of Scripture you're just going to ignore? They're inconvenient. Interestingly, verses 8 and 9 is one sentence in Greek. Isn't that a big run-on sentence right there? It's one sentence. Verse 8 has the, the command, think on these things. Verse 9, it's do these things. And the benefit of thinking on what's praiseworthy and of doing what was learned and modeled is God's presence. The God of peace will be with you. How does command number 6 end? The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The last one, the God of peace. Is that coincidental, you think? Seven final appeals to the church body. He's writing to the family of God. He's writing to the believers in Christ. But you know, these are not easy. Stand firm. There's false teachers all around. Live in harmony. You don't understand the people who attend this church. How can I live in harmony with everybody? Rejoice always. You don't know the trouble in my life. How can I rejoice? Let your gentle spirit be displayed to all. 
Well, that's outright un- impossible. In everything, pray. In e- Come on, be real. In everything, think on what's praiseworthy and dwell on that and do what was taught and modeled. In closing, I want you to go back to chapter 3. So there are two types of people in the Christian community. In verse 18, Paul writes, For many walk, in other words, this is how they live their lives, for many walk of those of whom I have told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Where are these people? They're in the church. Whose end is destruction. That's not a good end. Whose God is their appetite. They live for what they get their desires of their life. And whose glory is their shame. And who set their minds on earthly things. See, these are those who profess their Christianity, but really they're enemies of the cross. They worship a different God. They set their minds on the earthly things. They look like believers, but they may not be. That's one type of people, person in the Christian community. And then you have verse 20, where Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to a different realm. We belong to the realm where we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes, he will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Is that an amen? Two realms, both in the Christian community. They profess Christianity, but they're really serving self. And there are those who profess their Christianity knowing they're citizens of heaven waiting for their Savior. And then you get to chapter 4, and this is where the rubber meets the road, because he's going to give seven commands. And the first group usually fail in these seven commands. When culture pressure comes upon them, they don't stand. They go with the flow of the culture. You'll find them being the ones who complain, cause division in church. They're rarely joyful. They'd rather be right than gentle when it comes to issues. They rarely pray. And they have no trouble thinking on the wrong things. And they follow Scripture only when it suits them. They don't want Scripture that's been taught to them and follow it. Now, the second group, the ones who have their citizenship in heaven, are by no means perfect in these seven commands. But they know them to be true. And they know that when they fail them, they're feeling conviction by the Holy Spirit in one of those areas, whatever the issue is of the seven. Because God's not pleased when you're not following his commands. And when you break his commands and you're not rejoicing or you're not being gentle or you're in arguments and you're in disunity or you're not standing firm or you never pray about issues that really matter, well, God's spirit to his child, will, God's child will bring conviction. And a believer in Christ normally takes conviction and they confess sin to God and then they change. That's called repentance. And they turn and they begin to follow those commands. (coughs) Which group are you in? (laughs) 
He brings it out really clearly in chapter 2, verse 21. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of who? Christ Jesus. Two groups. One group lives for self-interests. The other group live for Christ's interests. What group are you a member of? Lord Jesus, we come before you thanking you for what you've been teaching us through these seven imperatives, seven commands. Forgive us for the times that we fail and we don't repent. Lord, if you're convicting anyone here today of their need for a Savior, may they humbly come to the cross, confess that they are sinners in need of a Savior, and may they throw themselves upon the grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ who died in their place. Lord, we want to be a church filled with people who know their citizenship is not America, but their citizenship is heaven. And so we look at these commands as not being suggestions. We look at these commands as this is what you expect from your people. Lord, it's been good to be in this place at this time to read your word and to understand what it's saying. Now may your spirit do its, his work in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.